Good afternoon and welcome to this ODMAP webinar, Bridging Efforts Between Public Safety and Public Health to Aid Overdose Victims. I'm Morgan Gargiulo, Senior Communications Specialist with Qualidime, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Uh, next slide, please. Before we get started, I wanted to give you a little background on Qualidime. Um, for those of you that don't know, about a year ago, Maine Quality Counts merged with Qualidime, um, and we are a mission-driven national healthcare consulting organization with multiple offices across New England. Um, we have over 35 years of experience in improving healthcare delivery, and we specialize in quality improvement, project management, and technical assistance. We've been a leading federal federal quality improvement contractor since 1983, and the Northern New England's Practice Transformation Network since 2015. Next slide. Just a few notes about today's webinar before we get started. Uh, all participants are in listen-only mode, so please use the Q&A function to ask questions or make comments throughout the presentation. Um, you can enter them throughout, and we will address questions with our speakers at the end. Um, the video uh, screen size and location are adjustable, so feel free to move things around to your liking. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and we will be sharing um, the slides and, a re and the recording with you in a follow-up email in the next day or so. Um, and lastly, if you're joining by phone or on the computer with someone else, um, we just ask that you send um, your name and email address to Amy Carter. Um, a Carter at qualdime.org, just so we can have an accurate list of attendees for our records. Next slide. So now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, Eric Harum is the owner of Harum Consulting LLC, a healthcare and behavioral health care, a health and behavioral health care consulting firm. Um, Harum Consulting offers large and small scale technical assistance for all aspects of strategic planning, workforce development and clinical and business systems designed for states, institutions, and organizations. Mr. Harum has 30 years of experience in delivering, designing, delivering, designing, and directing substance abuse treatment services to hospitals, correctional facilities, and community behavioral health centers. Um, next, we have Rebecca Taylor. Uh, Ms. Taylor has a background in clinical medicine, academic research, and health data analytics. She is Maine's public health analyst for the New England high, dense, high Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. Wow, that's a mouthful. Um, overdose Response Strategy. In this role, Rebecca, support, Re Rebecca promotes and supports data sharing systems that allow public health, law enforcement, and community partners to respond quickly and effectively to prevent overdose deaths. Since September of 2019, she has been working to foster st strategic evidence-based responses that can generate immediate reductions in the number of overdose-related fatalities. And lastly, we have Amy Carter. Amy has worked for Qualidime since January of 2017 as a program specialist for the Northern New England Practice Transformation Network, as well as program manager and consultant for the ODMAP um, program. Prior to working at Qualidime, Amy has worked multiple areas of the healthcare industry for over 20 years. Um, as a divisional coordinator for DeVita, Amy successfully piloted the health insurance premium payment program for her region, leading to the spread of the program throughout multiple regions. The results led to better patient outcomes, a decrease in missed patient appointments, and an increase in revenue. Next slide. So now I'm just gonna go over the um, learning objectives for today. As a result of attending this webinar, you will, you will understand the benefits and key components of the ODMAP tool, identify ways to apply strategies to optimize partnership, identify ways to use spike and overdose alerts to create proactive approach, understand how to effectively utilize the main AG approved memorandum of agreement for the ODMAP partnerships, and gain access to community education kits, tools, and best practices from other states to accelerate implementation. So with that, I will pass it over to Amy to get us started. Thank you, Morgan. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. 
Um, I'm Amy Carter, and I'm going to talk about ODMAP. So what does ODMAP stand for? Um, it's the Overdose Detection Mapping Application Program. It's a nationwide syndromic surveillance tool. It provides near real-time data of suspected overdoses. Um, it was created by Washington Baltimore HIDA, um, and it's free to available government agencies, state, local, federal, or tribal. Um, the program is designed to facilitate near real-time data sharing and timely responses to changes in overdose patterns, such as a sudden increase or a spike in overdose events. It links the information that is entered by first responders to a mapping tool which tracks the overdoses to promote real-time responses and can also be used to strategically analyze, um, analyze across different jurisdictions. So back in March of 2019, Maine DHHS with the Office of Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services partnered with us here at Qualadyne, um, along with New England HIDA and the Department of Public Safety to promote the use of the ODMAP tool across the state of Maine. Um, our focus was to start promoting this tool with law enforcement agencies um, when we started this back in March, there was eight agencies that were utilizing the tool. And as of today, we're up to 73 agencies using it. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Rebecca so that she can give you guys a deeper dive into the OD map tool. Hi, so what you're viewing now is essentially the data entry screen for level one users of ODMAP. And this can be anyone within your agency who is um, either going to be responding to an overdose situation or who may be the person who um, needs to be responsible for entering information. Ideally, it would be the first responder. And um, this level one um, interface is designed to work on any type of mobile or desktop device. Um, it can work on a phone, it can work on a tablet, it can work on um, the computer inside an emergency response vehicle. And it's designed to be very quick and user-friendly. Um, minimal effort, minimal time, takes less than one minute to complete um, an entry for an overdose. So we really are trying to encourage folks who are first responders to um, get this out of the way as quickly as possible and keep going with the important work that they're doing. Um, so the really great thing about this level one user interface is that it automatically captures the date and time that um, this interface is being accessed. So we're really trying to minimize uh, the, the number of data points that the user has to enter. So all you have to do, um, it, it defaults to capturing the GPS coordinates where the person, the responder is, um, or it, you can enter an address if that would be more appropriate for the response situation. Um, all the user of this interface needs to record into this form is whether or not uh, the overdose incident is fatal or non-fatal and the extent to which naloxone is administered, if it is administered, how many times it was administered. So uh, very simple and straightforward. Like I said, it takes less than a minute typically, even less than 30 seconds once you get the hang of it. So it's a very designed to be very user-friendly. Uh, next slide, please. So then what you're viewing now is um, the level two user um, uh, interface for ODMAP. And we call this the user dashboard. Um, this is what you would see the, when you log into um, ODMAP, what you see initially is the entire United States and all of the areas throughout the country who, which are using um, ODMAP, which is quite a few few states at this point. I believe it was 33 at the last count, but I, it may be more now. Um, so the ODMAP data that um, is collected is all fed into this user interface. And you can see that there are different colored dots on the map, and those indicate um, different uh, data entry points. 
So this ODMAP data is um, controlled, unclassified information. It's only um, released to authorized personnel, so there is a, an application approval process to be a level two user. Um, and typically the uh, level two users must either be a part of law enforcement, public safety, criminal justice, or public health. Um, so this level two uh, user interface, um, obviously the purpose of it is to assist with um, decision makers in those fields, uh, particularly law enforcement, public safety, public health, to be able to view and analyze um, overdose data in near real time. And so the critical thing about ODMAP is that it is only as good as uh, the information timeliness that is being entered. So we always you know, want to get the message out that using ODMAPs and, and entering the data is critically important, but entering the data as soon as possible when an event occurs is what makes ODMAP the most valuable it can be because what we want from this tool is to be able to identify, first of all, when overdoses are occurring in near real time, and secondly, be able to use the features of ODMAP, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, the spike alert feature and the overdose feature, to be able to identify when there may be a public health, public safety threat, such as a bad batch of um, drugs or a particularly um, dangerous uh, batch that may be uh, contaminated or intentionally formulated to be very strong. So um, that's the purpose of, of this uh, piece of ODMAP is, or this interface of ODMAP is to allow uh, decision makers to understand what is going on in near real time in their um, areas of responsibility. And just a side, or not a side note, but an important note is that per the ODMAP teaming agreement, um, ODMAP must only be used for its intended purpose. And we'll get more into that as we continue on with the slides. Uh, next slide, please. So there are different types of alert systems that are built into the ODMAP functionality. There are standard spike alerts, there are overdose alerts, and then there are statewide spike alerts. So what is a spike alert? Well, as the name implies, a spike alert is um, an automatically generated um, message that comes out of ODMAP when the number of overdoses in a given area exceeds a preset number in a given 24 hour period. So the purpose of these spike alerts is to notify your agency when um, when the number of overdoses in a set geographical area has gone has equaled or gone over the number that you set for your area of responsibility in a given 24 hours. So what's important to know about spike alerts is that um, you as a level two user can set your spike alerts to whatever level um, is appropriate given um, the history and sort of burden of overdoses and uh, substance use in your area. So it's important to understand and do the research for your um, area of responsibility so that you know what level to set your spike alerts. Um, like I said, administrators, level two users of ODMAP um, can set these spike alerts for their own area of responsibility. But what's really um, interesting and helpful is that you can also set spike alerts for any other um, geographical area that may um, have importance for your area. So for example, I'm up here in Maine, much of our um, supply in terms of uh, illicit substances comes up I-95 from Massachusetts. And so, um, if I wanted to set an alert for, say, Lawrence, a spike alert for Lawrence, Massachusetts, so that I might know in advance if there may be um, a dangerous batch of substances or, say, a cluster of overdoses happening in Lawrence that may work its way up I-95 to my area of responsibility, I can do that as an administrator as well. Um, 
so in this sense, uh, being able to set these spike alerts um, allows ODMAP to be an early warning system um, for your area of responsibility if you are aware of sort of the supply routes of illicit substances for your area of responsibility. Nearby jurisdictions as well. So if you know you wanted to set spike alerts for surrounding counties or surrounding states, you can do that. And again, these spikes, spike alerts are automatically generated through the system when a certain number of overdoses occurs within a 24-hour window and um, the alert is sent via email to whoever you designate as the person or persons it can be one person or more than one person who um, receives the email message um, it's recommended for uh, who the administrator who is setting up the spike alerts to minimally include the police chief for their area, um, the fire and or EMS chief, um, a local health officer, if that is something that you have, and any others who may play a key role in responding to a sudden increase in overdoses in your area. So moving on to overdose alerts. Spike alerts are, um, as we mentioned, a cluster of overdoses in a certain geographical area over a certain time period. Overdose alerts are singular. So what um, OD Maps allows in terms of singular overdose alerts, like a one, one person having an overdose is also obviously captured in OD Map. And what the overdose alert um, allows is for uh, partner recovery agencies to be notified when a person has overdosed and respond in um, the appropriate manner to connect that person with support services, whether it be um, contacting them in the emergency room to connect them with treatment options or following up within a 24 to 72 hour time window to provide um, support through peer recovery, whatever um, programs you have available in your area, you can use these overdose alerts to connect those services with the folks who need them in a rapid fashion so that people aren't falling through the cracks. And then finally, statewide spike alerts are similar to the standard spike alerts, except that they apply to the entire state. So you can subscribe to these statewide spike alerts as well um, as, uh, as appropriate and useful to your particular area of responsibility. Uh, next slide, please. And I will hand this back over to Amy. Thank you, Rebecca. So when we first started implementing OD map here in the state of Maine, we did a little research on who was utilizing, currently utilizing OD map and what were some benefits or, or um, hiccups that they found along the way. Um, we got in touch with Captain Gould through Chicatawaga Police Department in Erie County, New York. Um, and they, they use OD map and it, in a beautiful way, actually. So they partner with their public health department um, and they started implementing ODMAP in September of 2017. So what this graph here shows that in 2016, they had 167 overdoses with 16 deaths. In the fall of 2017, they built this partnership with um, their public health nurse and they have a peer support recovery person who navigates and goes out to the victims through that overdose alert system in OD Maps. So the police department enters in the information and that person is deployed once, the, once they get the information. They actually contact the police department um, and get a full report, full police report. Um, and we have an MOA that we created with the AG's office and the um, state police attorney, Chris Parr, which we'll show you a little bit later in this presentation. So in 2017, they had 113 overdoses with 10 deaths. After implementing ODMAP, they dropped their numbers down to 63 overdoses and five deaths just by reaching out to people and getting referrals um, to them and getting services to them. They, ha they had a 47% of referrals remain connected with care beyond 30 days. So they, they saw a huge increase and this made a huge impact. I'm now gonna turn this over to Eric.
Hi, so um, a big part of this, uh, as you can gather, is really how do you uh, knit together <clears throat> um, your various partners uh, to actualize these improved communication features with OD mapping. Um, ultimately, those improvement opportunities uh, can help increase utilization of resources at both the state and local level and have them be more efficiently coordinated. Um, the opportunity to increase the response level across all of those uh, sectors of healthcare, public health, and public safety, um, increasing the ability for all of those sectors to improve their own planning and viable workflows, um, creating opportunities to enable departments and different sectors to develop uh, unique and innovative solutions for your particular region and geography. Um, allowing for better resources for funding, staffing, and support to be utilized more effectively um, and efficiently, and to reduce redundancies. Uh, and, and the same thing again with the workflows as it relates to communication and deployment. Let's look at the next slide. So I wanted to just give you kind of the, uh, a visual here of, <clears throat> in public health you know what we sort of refer to as the the medical neighborhood um, this is really uh, that in combination with our partners in local and uh, county and state law enforcement uh, and you can see here the od map um, entry date uh, is really right at the center of this um, as first responders there is the opportunity for that real-time data entry and um, the uh, overdose alert that Rebecca was just referencing that can be automated for uh, communicating and deploying your chosen um, recovery uh, uh, and navigation resource to the location of that overdose victim. Um, and, and that's the, the light blue circle here um, in the um, uh, center uh, around the OD map in, entry and public safety. Uh, and there you've got um, medication assisted treatment in emergency departments, recovery coaching, um, navigation to uh, substance use treatment programs or providers, um, as well as other organizations. <clears throat> of a behavioral health nature in, in the particular region. Um, taking that out further to the outer ring, uh, as you can see, uh, a lot of robust services um, and the types of things that they are able to provide. Traditionally in our regions, um, navigating across something like this can be uh, laborious and frustrating. Um, not always aware of which organizations are doing what services, what changes have occurred, uh, who may be open or who may be closed. Uh, and so the opportunity to really define these things in an OD map partnership um, is, I think, really critical. Let's look at the next slide, Amy. So this is a, a, an example of uh, kind of a generic workflow, and, and I think one that has a lot of applicability across the various um, potential implementations in our state uh, here in Maine. And so you can see we've, we've really divided this into three uh, swimming lanes, for lack of a better description. From the top to the bottom, um, you have the actual overdose victim. Uh, the middle lane being law enforcement and the recovery support partners being uh, at the bottom. And so where we arrive here is, if we just walk through this, is you have um, the person who is identified as an overdose victim. Um, law enforcement dispatched to call identifies the victim and as you saw on the level one user screen that Rebecca reviewed, uh, about 30 to 60 seconds worth of critical information to be logged into the tool at that time. The recovery partner then receives that alert from OD Map as you've defined it. Uh, they contact the identified administrator at the PD and um, 
receive the information uh, and then are deployed back to the victim. If the victim refuses help, the recovery support partner um, is going to be able to provide them a package of uh, relevant information as well as give that uh, information to uh, any caring others who may be available for that person. Um, and then they're going to follow up with that individual at least at 30, 60, and 90 days uh, in the event that they change their mind. Um, and so back up to the top here, if the victim in fact does want to know about options available to them as a result of this overdose, um, they can help them navigate uh, to receive a professional substance use disorder assessment and identify appropriate levels of treatment for that individual, uh, and then help them navigate and get enrolled in those services while continuing to follow up at 30, 60, and 90 days. Um, and, and finally, on this bottom page, if the, the victim is not interested in professional treatment services, uh, recovery support community package is going to be made available to that individual and any caring others involved in their life so that they are aware of the many pathways uh, to support them towards health and safety uh, while continuing to follow up at 30, 60, and 90 days. Let's look at the next slide. So some of the tools uh, and things that we recommend for these informational packets. So in uh, Chikatawaga, um, New York, again, as the example, they have kind of this uh, uh, very bright orange envelope with the outside of it saying, your life was saved this time. Please read the information in this envelope. Let's look at the next slide. So in terms of responding to these overdose spikes, um, really thinking through a suggested framework, right, with uh, at the center, again, developing a spike response plan, um, coordination with the Department of Public Health and local stakeholders, uh, reviewing any historical data to define what spikes uh, are relevant to you in your area of responsibility, um, how it is that you're going to coordinate uh, and develop that response plan. And that may include things such as a, a bad batch alert. Um, and there are templates for messaging around that that we want to get available to folks. Um, and then finally, establishing a means of contact uh, and communication systems. And, and this is sort of simply what we've been uh, reviewing so far in, in this afternoon's time together. Next slide. So these are some examples of um, how these things can uh, bear out. Right? Uh, in response to the heroin epidemic, the Portland Police Department launched LEAP, which stands for um, Law Enforcement Addiction Advocacy Program. Um, modeled after a nationally recognized um, program, the LEAP Substance Use Disorder Liaison, focuses on three key elements of outreach, education, community awareness, and facilitation of treatment. Uh, this person will engage known users and then provide support and offer treatment options. Um, this is uh, one such model that is, uh, I think, going very, very well in Portland. There, uh, in fact, um, uh, navigation individual is uh, Oliver Bradeen. Uh, they're a substance use liaison, and we've included contact information here. Uh, and encourage you to, to reach out to one another. Um, it's very uh, helpful to not have to reinvent the wheel, and so any opportunities that we have to replicate uh, the work that some of our colleagues have done in other regions and advance our cause, uh, I think is well worth it. Um, the last example here, and I'll just uh, paraphrase this, is the text is quite small. Um, the Greater Portland Council of Governments uh, has a, a, a really uh, innovative program uh, going on with a number of different communities, Cape Elizabeth, Falmouth, Gorham, Portland, Scarborough, uh, South Portland, and Westbrook. Um, and I had the occasion to go to the uh, Falmouth uh, event where, where really community stakeholders 
um, that you would find involved in your ODMAP partnerships uh, got together and really looked at, you know, what's going on in our community and what are some of the things and priorities that we can do um, to uh, reduce stigma, drive policy change, and, and maybe get a little bit further out in front of this epidemic. Um, and OD mapping was a significant part of the strategy at the end of the evening. Uh, and I had the opportunity to, to sit and uh, talk with uh, the Falmouth police chief, who uh, is a very uh, compelling speaker uh, and I think is someone that I would encourage others to reach out to about some of their experiences um, and strategies that they've employed. Let's look at the next slide. So uh, again, um, these are just good examples of uh, statewide uh, opiate reporting. Um, there are some newsletters that are available here in the SWORD newsletter, uh, and these can be really helpful uh, for uh, emergency medical services and first responders at being able to see really the lay of the land at a glance. Uh, as well as your contribution to that information uh, through your own real-time um, uh, use of the OD mapping tool and the entering of information. So let's look at the next slide. So we want to really think through what are some strategies to optimize these partnerships. And uh, Maine, I think, has a, uh, a robust history with community policing programs, lots of experiences and lots of success uh, in a uh, uh, previous position um, in the 90s when I worked for uh, the Maine Office of Substance Abuse as the uh, manager for correction services. I attended the Justice Assistance Council meetings on a regular basis and participated uh, in those uh, RFP developments and uh, review of proposals. And um, the whole state does a great job uh, and is quite innovative with these programs. So really wanting to frame uh, OD mapping and the threading together of these community partnerships uh, as just another example of community-based policing that we have a lot of success and experience with, right? And, and what we've learned ultimately is uh, for sure, uh, under community policing model uh, where officers are empowered to identify and solve problems proactively, uh, any one individual officer really can transform a community. Um, being an effective community policing officer involves a unique blend of skills. Uh, as you know, um, and really is defined uh, by involving three key components, um, community partnerships, engagement in problem solving, and implementing community policing organizational features. Um, and there is a fair amount of funding uh, available uh, at the state uh, and national level. Um, that I want to be able to uh, impart as it relates to your community, community policing efforts and OD map uh, implementation. Uh, and so again, a plug with the Justice Assistance Council, the Departments of Juvenile uh, Justice, as well as the State Department of Public Safety um, funding initiatives that exist to support and enhance community policing efforts like OD map partnerships. Let's look at the next slide. So this is the main memorandum of agreement that um, Amy uh, identified earlier. So this is one more of the tools in the uh, implementation and operationalizing OD map partnerships toolbox. Um, and I think this was very forward thinking on the part of the organizers with this expansion effort um, to have pre-developed a HIPAA compliant um, uh, memorandum of, agree of agreement uh, regarding communication uh, about this information, who has access to it, and how it's used. Uh, as you can see, without going through every line item here, this is very salient, about uh, a page and a half, um, and I think it's very straightforward. You do not need a law degree to read, interpret, and understand what each party is agreeing to and responsible for. Um, these are the kinds of things that can jam up community progress uh, for months and months and months 
as a group of stakeholders in each region of the state convenes to develop these kinds of communication agreements. Um, and, and so again, an opportunity to accelerate uh, the pace of our effort by having these vetted um, at a higher level um, for us. Next slide. So uh, again, I'm back to this because I think it's just such an easy visual to see. Uh, okay, so we want to do this OD mapping uh, within our uh, local law enforcement agency. And so let's start to think about who are the partners that we want to be in communication with. Uh, how do we want to automate uh, the spike alerts and the overdose alerts? Who is going to receive them and be deployed? Um, right, and, and so again, back to this uh, model here to give you that visual um, and a way to prompt our memories. Oh, it, it, what are the local emergency departments that I transport to? Do they offer rapid access to MAT? Um, where are uh, the recovery coaches in proximity to that? And are they gonna be able to help navigate that person to appropriate resources? Uh, recovery centers, ongoing coaching, as well as MAT and or professional treatment services. And at, again, the 30, 60, 90 day follow-ups as we get out into the outside of this wheel, um, uh, is the individual been able to be plugged into some of these areas that we know to be very helpful at sustaining a person's uh, recovery uh, and overall safety and wellness? So let's look at the next slide and sort of uh, thicken that a little bit. So there's been a lot of changes here in the state of Maine uh, with uh, capacity expansion to particularly MAT, uh, medications for addiction treatment, um, as uh, well as ways to do that in the most efficient, safe way. Um, and we can forget sometimes that we're making huge progress and that the state of affairs for this population um, today is better than it was uh, five years ago or even three years ago. And uh, certainly even less than that, right? And so here's an example of uh, where we have been with um, the uh, team RISE, which is rapid uh, access to uh, medication assisted treatment in the emergency department. Uh, a team of us with Quality Counts uh, worked throughout um, the uh, summer and fall to uh, assist all of these uh, emergency departments across the state to develop this capacity for medications for addiction treatment. Um, all of the ones that are dark green are actively providing this service today. Uh, I would add uh, on the right column that Northern Maine Medical Center has recently uh, implemented in December um, and will be heading up to Holton on Sunday of this week to do another round of trainings up there. So that will be an addition. Uh, and then of course they'll be adding um, Caribou and Cary Medical Center to that in the coming weeks. So as you, you look at this, you can see a, a fair amount of new capacity for a really quick standard of medical care for these individuals. Um, we are also working at getting recovery coaching deployed to each of these institutions to assist with that point of care navigation support um, and any kind of resourcing and education that folks may need. Let's look at the next slide. So to just kind of underscore this, uh, the reason these ED programs have done this is uh, these four pillars, right? Is they wanna track lower prescribing rates. Um, they wanna be able to operationalize guidelines and education for professionals about alternatives to opioids, reducing uh, risk through Narcan prescribing and patient education, and actively engage people in, in bona fide uh, relief strategies and treatment and referral. Um, so the next slide. Uh, and in fact, because substance abuse treatment with medications uh, works and is still greatly underused. Um, again, there is capacity developing in real time that uh, is difficult for all of us to necessarily keep up with. Um, and we can get mired in the old belief that um, it's impossible to find help for folks uh, unless maybe they go out of state. 
uh, or have private insurance. And that is less and less the reality. And so uh, underscoring here that this really is the standard of care for opiate use disorder. Let's look next slide. Um, and so an example, these are some uh, partners in uh, the uh, Rockland, Waldo, and Damascata regions. And this is kind of cool because if you, you draw a line, this actually is an algorithm for handing off patients from emergency departments to community treatment programs with medication-assisted treatment. Um, across that region from essentially uh, Brunswick uh, up to the Belfast area. And so you can see here uh, the folks at Penn Bay uh, Emergency Department will call um, the Maine Behavioral Health Program in Bark in uh, Rockland. Um, and they're either going to leave a message or talk to a human and, and that person will take the information. Um, that's really a one phone call system and it. These emergency departments don't need to be calling 10 different treatment centers to find somebody. They need a partner and they need a partnership that's going to work and it's going to work every single time. So what they're doing here at uh, Maine Behavioral Health and Bark program is then triaging that case. Uh, collecting the vital clinical information, um, and then based upon the zip code of where the person resides, right, they're going to be moving that person towards uh, a number of different programs. Um, so it's most convenient to the uh, overdose victim, um, and it is efficient for the emergency department partnerships so that they can uh, in fact, keep the door open and keep moving and have that capacity for who may arrive next, uh, right? And so um, I think they've done a great job with this. And this is, again, an example to show you that these partnerships are, are developing nicely across regions of the state. And there are really good opportunities to, to advance our OD mapping partnerships um, in light of these uh, efforts that are underway. Next slide. So there are um, a number of regional coalitions around the state that we want to uh, highlight and make sure that uh, our partners in law enforcement are aware of because these are, in fact, great groups for you to link with on your OD mapping strategies. Um, so uh, the Maine uh, Health Access Foundation has a uh, grant program in its third year now, Expanding Access to Addiction Treatment, uh, and there are 10 regional coalitions all working collectively. Uh, on that endeavor. And so some of the outcomes, to just give you an idea of progress to date from 2017 to 2018, uh, these grantees saw the number of x wavered MAP providers affiliated with their programs grow from 27 to 124 prescribers, uh, and the number of patients engaged in uh, medications for addiction treatment uh, increased from 199 to 806 in that same time frame. Um, that's a lot of uh, improved capacity um, and, uh, in fact, reasons to advance your work with OD mapping, uh, given the um, availability in the safety net. Let's look at the next slide. So, <clears throat> to, um, for your information, th these would be the regions and the contact individuals. Uh, and so, without necessarily going through each individual uh, line and person, uh, you've got Portland, you've got the down east region, you've got um, Lincoln, uh, Millinocket, you've got the um, Farmington area and Franklin County, uh, Kennebec and Somerset County represented, um, Lincoln County and Damariscotta, uh, Wiscasset region. Um, Augusta Waterville uh, through Maine General in the Bangor Brewer Hamden area, uh, Penobscot Community Health and their coalition, um, Tri County as a contact in the Lewiston Auburn area, and down in the southern seacoast region, uh, York Hospital and that community coalition. So many, many regions of the state represented, and lots of opportunities where these coalitions are now in their third year of getting themselves organized um, and uh, getting their workflows in place. These are great um, uh, existing projects to, to put yourself in the middle of um, and see where 
uh, that can support your efforts with OD mapping. Let's look at the next slide. So, so go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so back to um, the alerts, we're talking again about how ODMAP can help you in your communities um, take advantage of a tool that is free to use and um, very simple to operationalize and um, provide information to you and folks inside your agency that will then allow proactive action um, in your communities. So just back to sort of what I was talking about before, just to reiterate, um, these spike alerts through OD Maps, remember those spike alerts are the ones that um, will automatically notify you via email or anyone you designate as the administrator um, if the total number of overdoses in a particular area doesn't have to be your area, can be just an area that's important to your area, um, exceeds a predetermined threshold within a 24 hour period. And um, Eric went over the slide earlier that had the uh, spike alert um, sort of guide. So I highly encourage anyone who um, is involved and interested in using ODMAP to take a look at that um, spike alert guide to give you some guide rails on how to construct a spike alert action plan for your particular community because, you know, yes, it is great to know if a spike alert is happening, but then you also need to know what to do about it if, if that does occur. And having those systems in place before an emergency like that um, is identified is obviously the ideal scenario. So um, again, as I mentioned, uh, it's a, the level two administrators can set those spike alerts for their own jurisdiction, as well as other jurisdiction using the, the ODMAP dashboard that we looked at. Um, and that will allow um, using those uh, other jurisdictions as a sort of early warning system that will give you a, a sort of sense if a bad batch might be coming to your area and you will be able to then prepare accordingly. And again, um, using OD Maps is a really simple way. Uh, it's sort of a no brainer, automatic set it and not forget it, but set it and not have to worry about it anymore um, system where you can, as the administrator, list as many subscribers to the spike alerts as you um, think may be necessary. Again, emergency personnel, first responders, local health officers, folks at your hospital, anyone who may be playing a key role in uh, responding to a sub sudden increase in overdoses. And then you don't have to worry about, you know, making sure you email folks or call folks. Everyone gets those alert emails. So um, it's a really convenient way to make sure that you have those systems in place for communicating in case of, of an emergency. Next slide, please. So how can we operationalize um, these spike alerts that we've been talking about well again um, and this is also mentioned in that um, the ODMAP uh, spike alert guide that we that we saw and you can refer back to that document um, if uh, you go to the slides after this presentation there's a, a live link within the slides and you can take a look at that spike alert document it's really useful um, so the the critical uh, step in getting OD maps um, up and running in your area, obviously first is getting people to uh, work in the, um, in putting information into their workflows. But concurrently with that, it is critical that stakeholders in the area develop a local overdose, overdose spike response plan. So what does that mean? Well, you need to have uh, all the folks who would have input or need um, to deploy resources speak to each other ahead of time, coordinate. So state and county health departments to reduce any duplication of effort or resource deployment, um, meet with these folks to gain input about, um, not only to let them know like, hey, I'm going to put you on this overdose uh, spike response, but also to talk ahead of time about how you can coordinate efforts in case there is a spike in your area or one coming in your direction and also to incorporate an after hours response plan for the local public health department. So of course these things, you know, if they do occur, will probably not occur at a convenient during business hours time. And so there will need to be a communication plan in place so that um, 
the carefully set up overdose response um, that you have constructed also goes off swimmingly, even if it occurs in the wee hours of the morning. And also um, something that many communities who have implemented OD maps already um, develop a public service announcement template. So something that, um, you know, as soon as you receive a spike alert, you can automatically sort of send out a public service announcement to folks who are interested. And also, you know, prior to that, make sure you let folks know that they can sign up for, for these public service announcements. And second to that, develop a bad batch community alert system and template message. So you'll wanna coordinate um, the development of your overdose spike response plan with folks out in the community, either um, the community uh, treatment uh, care providers or other stakeholders in the community who are um, connected with the users themselves or their family members so that folks who are in the user community or care about those users can um, allow alert them if a bad batch is coming their way. And obviously that's you know a, a, a double-edged sword that we don't have to get into right now, but folks who may need to know, you know, there, there's a bad batch around and make sure you have your naloxone um, and have those messages thought out and um, in place ahead of time so that again, you don't have to think about it and figure it out when the emergency is occurring. So prepare that messaging to um, alert those target audiences and establish um, finally a means of contact with media groups um, so that you have a plan in place to dis distribute these public service announcements in the event of spikes. Nobody wants to be figuring out their media communications plan in the midst of a crisis. So it's, it's a better plan to have all those things thought out ahead of time. Next slide. So just a, a brief example of how this can work and is working currently um, in, our, in our partner uh, states. So as we mentioned at the, the top of this presentation, um, OD Maps began in the Washington, was originated and designed by the Washington Baltimore HIDA program. And so it's been in use for, for a number of years and has sort of gone through the iterations of being operationalized and um, developed inside various communities, very community specific ways of being helpful, not just to law enforcement and public health, but um, out in the community itself. So just an example from Virginia, um, OD Maps is being used by uh, the, the drug user community itself um, in one particular Virginia County, um, a substance abuse a treatment provider and harm reduction coalition actually worked together to leverage uh, the OD map um, overdose and spike response alerts or spike alerts, excuse me, to automatically generate um, text based user alerts. So um, an anonymous system where users could subscribe to receive texts in the case that um, a bad batch and users, not only users, but their loved ones as well and friends could uh, receive text-based alerts in case of a bad batch. And then when a spike alert occurs, these users can receive text-based support messages, encouraging them to stay in recovery and warning them of the danger of a bad batch in their area. And secondarily um, to these uh, alerts, peer support, outreach workers, loved ones, and treatment professionals can also receive the alerts. So allowing for targeted follow-up and support of these folks. So just one example of the many ways that ODMAP can be used out in the community to allow recovery, support, and um, engagement with folks to keep them safe and uh, leverage this real-time data to minimize the impact of, of any extremely dangerous uh, batches coming down your way. Next slide. So I'll hand it back to Amy, but I think that's the end of our presentation. And any questions would be more than welcome here. So thank you guys for that great presentation. Um, as of right now, we do not have any questions in the Q&A, but again, um, please make sure to 
put those questions in and we'll have Amy and Eric and Rebecca answer them for you. So we'll give it just another minute to see if any questions come in. So Amy, actually, if we want to go to the next slide while we wait to see if some questions come in, um, just wanted to let everybody know that this webinar was funded through a contract from the Maine Department of Health and Human Services. And this is the contact information for everyone that has participated in the webinar today. Um, if you need to reach out to us with any additional questions, feel free to do so. And the last slide, um, if you would like to follow us on social media, um, you can stay up to date with any upcoming news, events um, that may be going on. And it looks like we don't have any questions. So with that, um, we will end the webinar and please make sure to complete the evaluation that pops up on your screen. Thank you, Morgan. Have a great day, everyone.